Hello to everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for uh, the Tour Project's third Priv Chat. This will be my first conversation, which I will be moderating rather than asking questions, and I'd like to thank you all again for joining us. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, Tour, what it is, um, why it matters, the threats that are facing it, and more generally, what's happening with the internet, uh, the processes and powers that are affecting it, how they interact and affect uh, our lives, and the right to uh, access and express ourselves online. Um, and we're going to be joined uh, by a panel of experts, uh, three different individuals who I'd like to take a moment to introduce now. Uh, we have Alison Macrina uh, joining us from the Library Freedom Project, which she has founded. Uh, Burhan Tay, the Africa Policy Manager and Global Internet Shutdowns Lead uh, for Access Now. And Rami Raouf, uh, who is a Security Labs Technology for Amnesty International uh, and a member of the board for the TOR project. Thank you to all for joining us. Uh, with this, let me um, just say briefly, uh, for those who aren't familiar with the TOR project, this is, you can think of a uh, sort of pseudonymizing or anonymizing uh, network layer. You have uh, your connection on the internet uh, that is trying to reach something, some site, some service, some app. But instead of leaving a entry on the logs of the server that you're connecting to that says, I came from this internet address, which is mine, my house, the cafe that I'm sitting at, uh, the cellular network that I'm connecting to, Instead, you package your traffic up in a very clever way and you hand this off to volunteers for the Torn Network who are operating servers around the world in many jurisdictions. And they pass your traffic around using redundant layers of encryption, sort of like a shell game. Uh, and then this network on your behalf makes this request to whatever site it happens to be that you're interested in. Uh, they retrieve that and they send it back to you. Now, because of the way this shell game works, it does a better job protecting your identity, both uh, and both your identity and the content that you're trying to access from not only the internet at large and global passive adversaries, people like the NSA, your local police department, or the hacker sitting next to you on that local cafe Wi-Fi, um, but also from operators of the Tor network itself and ultimately that destination site you are trying to connect to. Uh, it's not perfect and it's much more complex than that, um, but I'd like to take a minute uh, to talk to our panelists and ask you, um, when you look at what's happening in the internet at large, uh, we have seen in the last decade uh, growing interest by governments, I think, in expressing the power of censorship. That can be done in more delicate terms where they try to filter traffic, they shape traffic, they throttle it, meaning make it slower, make it more difficult for you to connect, to live stream, or to access a political site. Uh, they could block access to these things entirely, or in response to a protest, uh, they could block these sites entirely. Now, when we look at this uh, from a Western European or American context, uh, we're generally thinking about companies spying on us or intelligence services spying on us. Uh, but when you zoom out for a minute and look at the internet from a more global perspective, uh, and you look at uh, regions like uh, China, Russia, Iran, uh, and, and largely Africa, uh, even Latin America, uh, you see these being expressed differently. I'd like to open with Burhan. Can you tell us a little bit about what you have seen in terms of internet censorship just in the last year, uh, what you've been tracking, um, and uh, how Tor helps with that, and where there are gaps left? Um, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so the past year is definitely not a really great indication um, was a really terrible indication of where the internet is going as an infrastructure, um, you know, a, as a tool for all of us to express ourselves, you know, to um, to to work, to live our lives for privileged enough to be connected. Um, so I really want to start this conversation with saying that you know, 50, about fifty percent of the world is offline. Um, so we're talking about um, you know half of the world and and where we are. So this conversation does not many are left out of this conversation. But the very difficult thing that we've documented, for instance, this, just this year and the past the past year, is if you look at internet shutdowns and you know and internet outages, uh, they're exponentially growing every year. Um, so in twenty in twenty nineteen, 
Within Access Now, we had documented over 213 internet shutdown incidents across the world in 33 different countries. Uh, if you look at 2020, we've already passed 120, 112 cases already. And you know, let's not forget, we're sitting in a pandemic where we're all forced to be, you know, and, and sit and work from home and learn from home. So the indication is that you know um, the internet is being highly censored and it's also being turned off whenever it suits governments. So I'll give you one example of currently what is happening in Ethiopia and Myanmar. If you're a Rohingya Muslim um, um, in, in Myanmar today, um, you're not connected to the internet because the Burmese government has decided to turn off um, mobile data in, in Rakhine and Chin states for the past one year. If you're, you know, privileged enough, unfortunately, and have crossed into, into Bangladesh uh, to access the enter, you know, to, to live and, you know, um, to live there as a refugee, your internet is also cut off. You're not allowed to access internet. So the, the Rohingya Muslims today, as we talk, are disconnected from home and are also disconnected abroad. Then now, if you look at Ethiopia, for instance, if you look at the, um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a war and armed conflict in, in Tigray region. Um, and one thing that's extremely devastating that we know has happened in, in Tigray is particularly is that, you know, the internet was cut off about a month ago and this inter the internet was cut off at a really important time where, um, you know, this conflict was starting. But what was more even even more devastating is in, in some regions that share the border with Sudan, many people have Sudanese SIM cards. So when the internet went off and, you know, um, uh, the groups cut off the internet, people were using their Sudanese SIM card. So what happened, and I'll quote, um, you know, uh, 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 one of the survivors of um, this massacre is that you know, there's a place called Maikadra, about 600 people were killed. Uh, and before the, you know, this, this armed groups went around killing people, they went from house to house looking for people's national identity cards. So the killings were happening based on ethnic lines. And they were also looking for people's SIM cards and they collected the Sudanese SIM cards that people had and destroyed it. That afternoon, the killing began and over 600 civilians were killed. So this is, uh, you know, this is what we're seeing. You know, um, we want we want people to be connected to the internet so that it's not even for any luxury. To, <laughs> for that, people can post videos of the atrocities that are being committed to them. Um, you know, that's what people are being denied today. So it's that's one aspect that is quite concerning and you know uh, devastating to to document. That is incredible. Thank you for sharing that. It's an indication of just how much is at stake here. Um, if we lose our ability to communicate, if we lose our ability to organize online, if we lose our ability to connect, not just in our communities, but across borders, um, we increasingly see powerful institutions of all kinds uh, that are actively um, interested in abusing their power, their control over those connections uh, to not only stop our ability to speak, um, but in some cases, unfortunately, uh, halt people's abilities even to live uh, in their societies. Um, Rami, I'd like to go to you. Uh, and just on this same topic, tell us a little bit what is happening in terms of um, intrusions into people's right to access and connect. Uh, and then from that, uh, what you've seen the TOR project is doing to try to help with this. Um, yeah, hi. Um, thank you for moderating this. And thank you, TOR, for organizing this. Uh, it's very nice to be with everyone. Um, Going back to your question, I think over the past 10 years, uh, we have seen evolving tactics uh, happening in Egypt and across different countries in North Africa uh, related to network interference and trying to manipulate how does the internet traffic works. And looking into how they were deploying different tactics from the mindset, uh, the way they would mass control people by using tear gas or weapons or different ammunition industries in an unlawful manner, they apply the same mindset on the digital space where they keep deploying different uh, gateways and guards to control uh, the internet in different ways. Uh, we have seen them moving from not only targeting content and websites, but also targeting specific services and protocols that usually the internet relies on and usually people using uh, a variety of services for security and privacy unable to do that. Uh, over the past two years and a half, for example, in Egypt, there have been an escalation in blocking websites uh, just because of their, their publishing narratives that the state doesn't uh, agree with. But moving from, from, from that space to checkpoints, for example, in, in the Egyptian streets in, in Cairo, for example, over the past five years, we have seen different incidents where the police would stop people randomly in the street and ask them to specifically open their Signal app or WhatsApp or their photo gallery. Uh, and based on what they see, they start to profile people and label you. You're either pro-military or anti-military, uh, and then decide how to deal with you. Uh, and it 
becomes very scary for people that just randomly in the street, some people with weapons stopping you and ask you, ask you to open your signal app or to open anything in your phone uh, to decide what to do with you. Uh, but at the same time, the more different tactics were deployed and are still being deployed, uh, it also somehow inspires people to become more res resilient around, around this kind of tactics. So for example, if you discuss different things like VPN, for example, if you discuss VPN uh, within Iran or China or Turkey, uh, people within the activist scene and the media scene and different domains, people had to develop their skills over the past maybe 15 years uh, to keep up with different problems going on. Uh, and there are a wide variety of, of, of skills that maybe from many years ago were considered advanced skills or for certain engineers or for certain people, but they're becoming more and more mainstream. Uh, I think the more the states try to deploy different tactics, uh, eventually it inspires people uh, on how to keep up their, their day to day operations. But at the same time, there are huge impact on people's privacy. Uh, and it's a de facto situation where there is nothing could be done due to lack of uh, proper laws, uh, due process and, th and things around that. I think um, when a lot of the audience uh, joins us and they hear about what's going on in, in uh, places like Egypt, they hear about what's happening in Northeast Africa, um, it feels very far away. Um, but it's important to understand uh, for all of you out there, uh, this is not something that simply happens uh, just far away. The expression, the extent to which it happens uh, is certainly different. Uh, but when we talk about just the sheer concept of spying on dissent, uh, monitoring the population, trying to identify protesters, organizers, uh, single them out, um, and ultimately act against them for purposes of retaliation, uh, is something that we have seen in the United States. And I'd like to go to you, Allison, um, to ask for uh, your experiences with this. One of the things that I remember uh, quite clearly, uh, this is a few years back now, is when the Black Lives Matters protests uh, first began kicking off uh, on flight monitors, uh, we saw these flight paths appearing of what turned out to be uh, airplanes contracted to the FBI that were simply flying in circuits uh, around protest sites uh, with the suspicion um, that they were taking a census of the cell phones uh, that were active at a protest site uh, or photographing these people to uh, try to see um, what was going on there. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's happening in the United States? Yeah, well, what you mentioned about Baltimore is really, I mean, that is, it's an important point of context in the, in a long history of this kind of um, monitoring of dissent, particularly black dissent in the United States. So a lot of folks who, you know, are, are interested in privacy, who are in our kind of human rights world are probably familiar with the history of COINTELPRO, which is a program that um, the US FBI and extended law enforcement engaged in, you know, 30 or 40 years ago to monitor specifically political dissent coming from black radicals and coming from the anti-war movement. And the thing about COINTELPRO is that it, it, it tells us a lot about the, the context and history of that moment, but it's something that has continued throughout the years. And we see that in particular in the way that people involved in the Black Lives Matter movement have faced state surveillance. So that Baltimore example, of, of course, part of BLM protests from a few years ago, we have seen that kind of um, state level uh, federal law enforcement and local law enforcement working together, also with many, many different corporate entities, you know, private surveillance companies. What we saw a lot this summer with the um, with the, the the BLM uprisings that kicked off across the country and also around the world is a continuation of this using, you know, planes, drones, um, you know, possibly stingrays, other kinds of um, uh, monitoring systems like that, but also law enforcement monitoring social media of, of activists. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest things is that we don't really know the extent to which U.S. law enforcement is using these tactics. I mean, of course, we've learned a lot in the in the last number of years I mean, with, you know, a great deal that we learned from you, Ed, but also many other whistleblowers and journalists who have helped to detail how much power U.S. law enforcement has to spy on dissidents. But, but frankly, like, that is is only one piece of the picture, and so all that we you know we can we can assume a great deal more, um, and I think that's where Tor comes into this context because you know using something like Tor the the the, 
the need for it in a place like the United States might not be immediately obvious but when you learn about how powerful our law enforcement is, how much money they have for different surveillance technologies, how they're using them against specifically the Black Lives Matter movement. But really, you know, there are a number of different efforts underway in the United States right now to, to take back power for the people. A lot of labor organizing is happening. A lot of climate justice action is happening. Um, and there are, there are um, there's solidarity across all these movements. It's a lot of the same people um, doing all of this work together. And so when you consider the power that our police have and our, our, our federal police, and including that as well, and the way that um, progressive forces, democratic, pro-democratic forces are really trying to take our power back, um, you know, using something like Tor in that context becomes really, the importance of it becomes, I think, a lot more clear. So I'd like to uh, go in, in just a minute to describe, we've been talking a lot about the threats here um, and, and where uh, the internet's facing um, pressure from governments, uh, both domestic to the United States and abroad uh, throughout the world. I'd, I'd like to share a little bit of a success story, which is uh, my own case and how I used to, to make the 2013 revelations of mass surveillance happen. Um, but first, uh, just a brief note for the audience. Uh, if you think Tor and Privacy Online is important, uh, I'd like you to please consider making a donation uh, to the Tor project. Um, volunteers, people like me, uh, ran servers for people like you uh, around the world. Uh, this has to be developed. It's an expensive and difficult effort uh, that's been happening for more than a decade now, uh, but it does make a difference. Protests uh, that could not have happened before uh, have happened as a result of it. News stories, such as what the NSA was doing, uh, how the United States government was breaking the law and violating the rights, not just of Americans, but people around the world, uh, may not have happened uh, if not for the way that people like me were able to use Tor to communicate. Uh, right now, all gifts uh, that are donated to the Tor project are going to be uh, doubled one-to-one uh, -one by friends of the Tor project. Uh, and if you make a gift today, that means the uh, power of your, your, your dollar, um, the, the volume of your voice uh, in this kind of funding war uh, goes much further. Um, and I, I think it's important to understand, as uh, Allison was just saying, what's happening is a little bit of a cat and mouse game. Uh, and this is a danger uh, where I think all of us go into ourselves, our own phones, our own systems, our own setup, and we go, you know, what do I do to protect myself? Do I install this tool? Do I use this browser? Will this fix it? Uh, the reality is we need projects working for us. We need experts working for us uh, who otherwise would not be able to dedicate that work. Um, and now they, they can. Uh, so getting back on uh, topic, I, I, I think when we've heard everything that we just heard, um, I'd like to go back to Burhan. Uh, working with Access Now, you see this happening in a global perspective. Uh, why do you think it's so easy um, for people who are positioned like Americans um, in the world to believe that it's basically countries, you know, sort of over there that have human rights issue, but so hard for them to see that these same kind of threats are germinating and beginning to grow in the United States. They're just more careful. They're just more delicate. They're not expressed the same way. Or uh, are they different in category and not identical? Is there sort of more of a nuanced distinction there? And these things will never be possible in the same countries. Uh, or is it really, when we look at a place like China, we're seeing the inevitability of our future if we don't act. Um, how would you describe or, or how do you contend with that problem that it feels like, wow, people who look at these things broadly globally see uh, sort of immediately you know, this, these giant trains headed towards us, um, but when they look at it at home, their own context, they're very comfortable. They don't feel threatened and maybe they won't do anything until it's too late for them to resist when they become threatened. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I think that it's, it's this assumption that, you know, the American exceptionalism and I am, um, I mean, I, I was schooled in the, in the U.S., I've lived in the U.S., and most Americans think they're exceptional and they don't have human rights problem. Um, and, you know, these issues are not just starting in the U.S. Black people in America have been marginalized since the day they were forcefully brought uh, to America. You know, uh, Native Americans have been subjugated to too many things. If you look at COVID, 
um, you know, the, those ones that are most affected are the most marginalized people. Um, so um, I, I think it's just, um, it's, I think it's just the framing and the understanding that America is exceptional. Um, so, you know, um, the rest of the, what happens to the rest of the world apparently doesn't happen in, to America, but that's not true. We've seen this, um, right, over and over. Um, so, I, I think the issues are are the same, and the way you know one thing that's quite clear uh, for many of us today is that uh, majority of the people that have been you know disproportionately affected by COVID today that are being surveilled by uh, you know um, COVID surveillance uh, apps or you know are not do not have access to the best healthcare are the most marginalized people around the world. Where I'm sitting here today, it's it's you know it's based on your income, education, uh, you know your 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 class, um, you know. So I, I think our, our struggles, to be honest, to be extremely honest with you, across the world are similar. It's just that. Uh, you know, if we're not affected by it, you know, if we're not sitting in the same room, we don't necessarily have that conversation. The, the fact that Black people are marginalized in America is no surprise. Black people are marginalized all over the world that they're in. Um, so, you know, so that's that's the reality. But unfortunately, one other thing that that is a bit, um, you know, concerning here is that, um, you know, we haven't created a lot of uh, grassroots movement. We haven't created a lot of movement that, you know, that that um, cross, um, you know, borders. I, I think, you know, as Alison was saying, BLM was 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 one where we saw, you know, the NSARS movement in Nigeria was also a concern in London, and you know what was happening in Baltimore was a concern here in Nairobi. Um, you know, so so those are, uh, you know, some of the trends and patterns that we we're seeing. But again, if we come from the, you know, the, the human rights and digital rights perspective, the trends that we're seeing that, you know, um, um, you know, the surveillance of, you know, Muslims, uh, you know, happens around the world. That's that's, you know, whether you're in America, whether you're you're in Nairobi, or whether you're seeing out of Somalia, the way that you're being surveilled because of your religion is is quite similar. Uh, the way that you know women are being targeted online is quite similar. Um, you know, the way that you know. Um, Black and minor minorities are being targeted. The way that human rights defenders are being targeted, the way Rami and I and, and Alison have been targeted by governments is is quite the same. It's because you know we're trying to fight a certain power, we're trying to fight a certain structure, uh, we're trying to um, you know. So it's I, I I think it's quite similar. It's just that um, you know we haven't framed it maybe necessarily in the same way for for the U.S. to really pick up uh, on, on those things. It's interesting because when you talk to me uh, and, and tell me about uh, all of these things, particularly the threats that are facing minorities, and then you uh, universalize this out more broadly to things like religion, uh, a lot of these differentiators, these uh, minority-making um, distinctions are about, as you mentioned before, access to education, access uh, to economic power. Um, these things increasingly become a proxy for class. Uh, we see a minority that has been uh, pushed into a lower class position and then policies are instituted to maintain uh, a uh, sort of soft caste system uh, that tries to maintain a class distinction. Uh, we see this a lot in the United States, I think, um, where our politics, particularly corporate media, um, is broadcasting uh, narratives that are trying to divide the country, um, trying to divide the people um, against each other into you're on the red team, you're on the blue team. You know, if you're on the blue team, red team's bad. If you're on the red team, blue team's bad. Uh, but the reality is the actual people who are constructing and perpetuating and uh, directing the abuses of our rights on both sides of the political body, uh, and even for those who are outside the political body, um, is the 1% sort of economic power. Um, we are being forced to look at each other um, as the enemy uh, <laughs> intentionally, uh, and I think perpetually to distract um, from that segment of society that holds and exercises true power uh, and then enacts abuses to secure and perpetuate uh, that system of control. So I want to go to Rami um, for a minute. We've talked a lot about these problems that are being faced. Uh, we mentioned before uh, how Tor can ameliorate some of these. It can't be used uh, to do things to, for example, connect you to the internet uh, when all of the fiber is down, unless you're going through satellite, unless you're going through a tower that's cross-border or something like that. Um, can you tell us a little bit, like, what are some of the threats that you would say uh, Tor is exactly the right tool um, to counter. And then what are the other threats, uh, things like paid informants, for example, or offline risks, um, that Tor isn't all you need, 
uh, or in fact may not help at all. How can you help people uh, contextualize this, see the whole infrastructure and understand where, for example, Tor could be useful for them and where you need something beyond that, where you need organization and political uh, direct action um, rather than trying to conceal um, and protect your communications. Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, I think when we when we discuss specific tools like Tor, for example, uh, it's useful to understand the use cases that people can can adopt because there is usually usually an assumption that one security tool could protect you from everything, uh, which is not hundred percent accurate. It's not even close to true. Of... I can tell you firsthand. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and for every threat and for every problem, there's a specific tool. Uh, it could be sometimes exhausting that there are many tools we have to adopt and use, uh, but that's the reality of, of, of the technology uh, at this point. Uh, but going back to your question and drawing on different examples, uh, one, of, one of the early moments, for example, in my specific case uh, that brought my attention to start using Tor and its entire ecosystem, uh, back then in Egypt between 2005 and 2008, one of the early experiments that the national ISP in Egypt tried to, to, to engage with is deploying a, a full surveillance system over all voice over IP over the internet. Uh, and there was a big scandal back then, uh, which turned out to be uh, celebrated later on, and they deployed something around that. Uh, I, I was much younger, and it, and it intrigued me a lot around, around that. Uh, and immediately afterwards, I realized that Tor itself has been blocked, uh, and I didn't understand exactly why specifically that's happening. Uh, going back to different examples uh, from, for example, uh, South Africa and Johannesburg uh, and Uganda and that part of the world, uh, it's very hard for people to access information related to uh, your uh, sexuality and identity and health uh, and certain uh, uh, problems that usually there is no enough knowledge around that for people to, to understand or the sources of information is extremely limited. Uh, and the fact that there are different blacklists being deployed across different regions uh, in Latin America and in Africa that would actively filter and, and monitor what are people reading and seeing makes it very hard and uncomfortable for people to uh, research some stuff online that could be basically about their health or about a disease or about a medicine, uh, but they don't want others to know that I am reading about this uh, or I don't want someone to know that I am ch ch checking this out. Uh, Tor helps a lot in, in providing you uh, a safe space to access information uh, in an equal and healthy manner without any power control or power dynamics. Uh, but it's also important to think of Tor not just a browser, it's an entire ecosystem that the browser is one element of it. There are many services running over Tor's ecosystem. Uh, so there are different tools that you can use to, for example, exchange files between NGOs or exchange files between a lawyer and a journalist and things like that in a very secure and safe manner uh, and it just provides uh, a different elements that the usual browsers would not would not provide that uh, at the same time uh, what ed was explaining earlier about how does tour work and its encryption system and so on uh, it's also good to remember that in different technologies and encryption is not torture proof at the end of the day uh, but in different realities with this with, di with different let's say, physical threats or, or, or threats to the right to assembly or the right to organize uh, or to publish or to start a newspaper or a political party like in Morocco or Algeria or in Yemen or in this kind of, or, or these parts. Uh, encryption tools and security tools are not always efficient in that sense. But also it's important to remember that different tools uh, work differently in different countries because the internet speed has a huge impact on people's ability to adopt new, new skills. Uh, when we look into VPNs or Tor, uh, they would they would work differently in New York or in Berlin versus uh, Sudan or versus um, Guatemala City or versus uh, San Jose, because the national internet address speed in, and in some countries could be three megabit and in some parts of the world could be much higher. Uh, and that's why it's not always easy for people to adopt tools like Tor, because for example, if you live in Germany and you use Tor over your mobile, you will not feel so much negative impact on your, on your activities. But if I'm in Cairo, for example, it becomes a problem. But this specific problem has been addressed, I think, in the past two, three years. And now 
there are different uh, uh, initiatives uh, by, by by tool makers and developers to adopt a much more healthier usability studies to make sure that their tools work cross-cutting equally uh, in, in different parts of the world without having any negative impact around that. Uh, Signal, for example, has been has been resilient in that, uh, and uh, they are doing a great job and and being accessible during time of censorship also. Thank you. I, I've got to say, uh, as someone who uses Tor uh, literally every day, <laughs> I have to say that the Tor project has done a really good job in improving the speed of the network, uh, the throughput of it. Uh, I've been using it for a very long time now, uh, daily since 2013, because I am concerned about my internet communications, uh, not just protecting the content of them, but uh, protecting the route to them, making it a little bit uh, more obscure, even if it's not perfectly obscure. Uh, so I'd like to take a minute here for everybody in the audience to, to think through a practical problem um, where, where Tor was useful for me. Uh, imagine that you work at the NSA. Um, you go in every day, you walk through a giant tunnel into the ground under a pineapple field in Hawaii. Uh, this facility was literally called the tunnel. Uh, formerly, it was the uh, Cunia Regional Security Operations Center. Uh, but everybody just called it the tunnel because why are you going to call it, you know, uh, the KR SOC? Um, now, you go about your job, you go about your work, spying on everybody. <laughs> uh, and then you realize uh, what you're doing is wrong. Uh, maybe you didn't realize you were spying on everybody. Now you see the whole picture. You see the government has broken the law. Um, there are no internal protections. There is no one you can go to. There is uh, no proper channels. There's no supervisor uh, who will take care of things. Um, there's been criticisms made uh, of me in the past or like, oh, you know, you should have gone to the Office of General Counsel uh, or you should have gone to the Inspector General or, or, or something like that. Uh, and everything would be fine. But if you looked at the history, um, the government creates these channels uh, to be able to identify internal dissent and defuse it, to quash it, to create a sort of a small reform, a false reform, to make them go away or to cover their, their uh, butts, as it were. Um, and then these things that go on uh, and the abuses perpetuate over time. This is to say these internal processes are great if you're uh, trying to report like workplace harassment or somebody stealing office supplies, but if you say what the NSA is doing, what the CIA is doing, what this large institution that affects the lives of everyone around the world is doing is actually in violation, not just of the laws written in the United States, but the basic boundaries of what laws can be written, how the Constitution functions. Uh, we know what that looks like. We actually have on video um, a official from the NSA's Office of General Counsel referring to the case of a previous whistleblower, a man named Thomas Drake, who is an NSA executive trying to reveal abuses on the NSA's warrantless wiretapping program under the Bush administration. And that conversation looked a little bit like this. I'm sorry, that's uh, not correct. That is uh, here. If he came to me, someone who was not read into the program and told me that we were running amok, essentially, and violating the Constitution, there's no doubt in my mind I would have told him, you know, Go talk to your management. Don't bother me with this. I mean, you know, you, you, you did the, the minute he said, if, if he did say, you're using this to violate the Constitution, I, I mean, I probably would have stopped the conversation at that point, quite frankly. So, I mean, if that's what he said he said, then anything after that I probably wasn't listening to anyway. Anything after that, the institution is probably not listening uh, to what you say anyway, right? That's a very, very true statement. Not. Sorry, a uh, little technical difficulties there. Um, but uh, this happened in Drake's case. Uh, this happened in my case, uh, where you see this happening continually. Institutions try to bury abuses. This is not unique to the NSA. This happens around the world. This happens in your country. This probably happens in your workplace. Now, you've identified something um, that you believe, <laughs> excuse me, is of public importance. The, the public needs to know this. But if you tell anybody about this, um, it will be the end of your career. It could possibly be the end of your freedom. What do you do? 
how do you contact journalists? You know Facebook's spying on you. You know Google has, you know, cookies and tracking pixels and everything like that uh, that are in your browser, they're in your phone, everywhere you go is monitored. Um, what can you do? Well, I gathered evidence that I believe proved uh, the allegations that I was making, and fortunately the courts have since affirmed that that was correct. Uh, that doesn't mean I can go home, unfortunately, because the law is broken um, in the way we have things set up. But this means you have uh, basically a hostile internet uh, that is actively trying to identify you, even when you're just reading an article in the newspaper or making a purchase for shoes. How well protected are you going to be when you try to reveal the story of the year, right? So for me, this is where the Tor project came in. I knew not only was I going to have to protect myself, I was going to have to protect the communication of journalists who had no expertise, they didn't know mass surveillance existed, any of this, uh, and construct this system. So I uh, basically set up a protocol where I left my home, I used specialized tools, uh, they're called war driving tools, uh, something called Kismet, to map out all the wireless access points on the island that I lived on in Hawaii, uh, and looked for ones that were unsecure or had uh, very weak security, and then I, I let myself into them. I then use this to connect to the Tor network using a special operating system called Tails, which is meant to lose any sort of forensic traces of the activity that you're making at the time. I then connected to new, fresh, anonymous accounts that had never been touched uh, except from this operating system that had no history uh, and from the Tor network with which I had no uh, direct connection because I wasn't connecting from my home, right? Even if they could break the security of the Tor network somehow, even if they could analyze the traffic, they would see someone at a cafe in Hawaii or outside a private home in Hawaii where there's no cameras or something like that. Not to me personally. And then it would go across the internet to journalists wherever they may be who are also connecting through the same Tails operating system, through this same Tor network. We did this in addition to you doing this, we encrypted all of our email communications. I rented servers uh, using Bitcoin that had been mixed to sort of try to minimize traces to my identity. Um, and all of this meant uh, that we could create a more private conversation, even on a less private internet. And while the system wasn't perfect, while it could have been done better, maybe you have better ideas how to do it, um, it did work. I was able to meet with journalists. I was able to coordinate with journalists without the government knowing that it was happening until the day after the story came out. They learned about it from the news. And that, I think, is a powerful uh, success story. And I think that's an important message. Uh, we're facing a stacked deck. As you've heard all night tonight, uh, things around the world are very difficult and very hard for people um, who are trying to communicate freely online, uh, particularly those who are trying to resist structures of power. And if you think uh, it's right that we, the public, retain the voice and the ability to speak, the ability to act, the ability to connect without interference, uh, I really think it's worth uh, considering making a gift, if you can give, uh, to the Tor Project. Uh, again, all gifts right now are being doubled. Uh, let me get back to our panelists, because I know I took a huge chunk of time there, and I apologize to everyone. Thanks for indulging me. Uh, I want to go to Allison. When you think about what's happened, uh, you understand the protest movement. You see the way people communicate. They've moved from using, you know, SMS and just phone calls to using encrypted messengers and, you know, uh, using non-centralized uh, sites to coordinate. But sometimes they still have to use something like Facebook, you know, which is just a cesspool of surveillance in order to get attendance, in order to get the message out. Uh, how do you see the evolving tactics that are related to the network interference that we've heard about tonight, media control and surveillance, impact people's uh, technology awareness and their skills and their ability to operate uh, both in their private lives and when they actually want to express dissent, particularly on the street? Oh, sorry, my mute button wasn't working. Um, I, so I, I think that's something that's really amazing about the current uprising that's happening in the United States. And I say current, I think that's really important for this international audience to be aware of, is that while you know we're taking a little break, it's cold in the US and most parts of the country right now, the uprising is still very much um, happening. It's not over, You know, we're gonna get back out into the streets and there's a lot of activity 
happening um, behind the scenes, a lot of efforts to defund local police and all sorts of things that are still going on. One thing that has been really incredible to see, you know, I've been working on in the in the privacy world um, for, you know, about seven years ish or so. And one thing that I've really observed this year, in particular over the summer is the way that um, people's security knowledge has really, really massively improved. Like, you know, just a few years ago, it was it was very difficult to see um, wh while there were many, many people, many different organizations trying to get good information about like what tools you should use, how to how to you know recognize that you have to organize on Facebook, you know, to some degree or another. But like, here's a way to use it a little more safely. There was a lot of bad information out there for a long time. That something that has really shifted this year is that it seems like there is. While while there's some misinfo that like is always going to persist, people have really caught on to what better practices they can be employing. Um, like one thing in particular that's become pretty ubiquitous, I would say, um, since the uprisings over the summer is people in the U.S. not sharing photos or videos of strangers' faces. The pandemic has helped with this, right? Because we're all wearing masks and we're harder to identify. Um, but but that uh, like awareness and and knowledge of like what the threats are has really, really shifted. And that's been amazing to see. Um, but we have a ways to go. I mean, I've, I was thinking about this as you were talking about how you did what you did and, you know, extraordinary and, and necessary as it was, like even just some of the pieces of it, I mean, like war driving, email encryption, renting your own servers, Bitcoin, most people don't know what any of these things are, let alone how to use them, let alone how to use them under duress. Um, one thing that we've really worked on a great deal in Library Freedom Project is trying to make privacy tools and privacy knowledge more ubiquitous. And the way we do that is we work with libraries. There's libraries in every community in the US. They see a lot of different kinds of people. You know, they're really a great place to like install Tor browser on the computers or teach privacy classes. And then it becomes something that people are more used to seeing. If we can make Tor ubiquitous, then it's less threat, less um, scary for the people who really, really need it in certain contexts. It's less of um, a red flag for law enforcement um, if you know if everybody's using it. But I think more broadly speaking, the approach that we have, and I think that's really important to your question, is we try to have um, a couple of themes in our our privacy advocacy and security training, which is one is harm reduction, that like. If you do a few things, even if you still have to use Facebook for organizing, okay, fine. But like, can you move your Facebook Messenger conversations onto Signal, um, or you know, can you minimize the the amount of of information you're you're sharing when you when you post Facebook invites or or things like that? And then the other thing is that security is a process. It's something that we have to embed into our organizing in all different sorts of ways. We're going to get better and better at it, um, but it's not something that you can just like download a bunch of tools and be done with um, and never have to do anything new again, unfortunately. <laughs> that That's really helpful. I, I want to point out the, you know, you make a great point, right? We're talking about kismet and more driving and things like that. And yeah, it's great. It's fun for the 10% of the people on the stream uh, who do have a little bit more of a technical background, even though this isn't, you know, space magic. Uh, it's certainly not the kind of thing that they teach you, you know, uh, when you're going to high school. Um, I think uh, one of the most important things for people on this stream to remember who have heard all this stuff about Tor, they're like, Tor, 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 what's Tor? Uh, they haven't gone to torproject.org and look at how it works. Um, you guys all have like a private mode on your browser, like on your you know phone, on your laptop, whatever you're using right now. Uh, remember the private mode is a lie. That doesn't make your traffic private. Doesn't mean Facebook doesn't know who you are. Doesn't mean your ISP doesn't know every single site that you're going to. Uh, because you're routing through their networks, right? Or you're connecting to their servers. God forbid you're entering your login information. This is associated with things like the time zone on your PC, you know, or uh, the equipment identifiers on your phone, all of these things that can uniquely identify you against everybody else in the world, right? Um, when you think about private mode in the browser, think the Tor browser. The Tor browser is not perfect, but it is the closest thing to a private mode for traffic that we actually have. Uh, if you're going to look something up that you don't want associated with you, it is a hell of a lot better um, than going through uh, your normal browser. Now, if you're using the Tor browser to connect to 
facebook.com and entering, you know, my name is, you know, Mark Davis or whatever, and here's my password, you know, Kitty Mittens um, at my email address. Uh, even if it's coming in anonymously from the other side of the planet, Facebook's still gonna know it's you because you just said, hey, it's me. But Tor can still be useful, the Tor browser, the Tor network in these kind of contexts. For example, let's say you want to connect to Facebook, but you don't know, you don't want Facebook to know where you were connecting from. You didn't want them to know your home IP address and you've never connected from your home IP address. Uh, Tor can provide what's called a locational anonymity. Uh, where your network address, where you're connecting from, is disassociated from your identity, uh, your, your physical identity, if you are providing that voluntarily. There's a, a many different ways to where it could be useful. Uh, many of them are not apparent. They only come from experience. Some of them are very obvious and useful. But in general, if you're using Tor, you will have a more private experience. It may not be perfectly private, but it's going to be a hell of a lot better. You can think of it as a chain of VPNs. Um, that are constantly rotating. Uh, and rather than being vulnerable to a single VPN writing you out, you would need cooperation um, between many different VPNs in many different places run by many different people uh, to cause the same level of harm to you. It is a safer uh, design. Uh, I'd like, let's consider we've gotten to the point of the conversation where we want to open this up a little bit. You guys shouldn't be uh, asking me to call on you one after uh, another. If you hear someone give a response, you want to tag on, you want to ask another question, uh, let's get there. I'll just go to um, Baran on one more uh, that I think everybody can have something to say about. When we think of everything we've described today and the threats that are coming institutionally, whether we're talking about corporate institutions, whether we're talking about governmental institutions, we're talking about uh, structures of power that have been created by the cooperation of many people uh, for the pursuit of either profit or power, right? Just raw power authority uh, that, that they want, then want to exploit um, to provide themselves a benefit at uh, the cost of basically everybody else. Uh, that's how these structures operate generally. Now, when we talk about governments and when we talk about corporations, we go, well, yes, we know they have extraordinary power. Yes, we know they have all the money. We have very little. Yes, we know they have the expertise in the people. But we live in organized societies. We live in a developed world. Many of us, some of us don't have that level of protection. Uh, and we have this magical thing that protects us from all evil. That is the rule of law. But as we've heard uh, today, whether we're talking about the United States, uh, where the government violated not just the law, but the Constitution, uh, or a place like Ethiopia, um, where you have uh, much more fractured processes and institutions, um, or you're talking about a place like uh, Egypt, where they've got, you know, laws on laws on laws, but the question is, who enforces them and how? Uh, the, the reality is the law is often used against the public at the same time it's not used for its benefit to restrain the government itself. This is to say we've got a two-tiered system of justice. The government can act freely whereas the people are restrained. When we think about the rule of law in the context of the censorship debate, when we talk about things like deplatforming, when we talk about things like... Um, Encryption backdoors, where government's going, well, this thing like the Tor network, these things like encrypted messengers, like Signal, uh, they're making our investigations more difficult, more costly. We don't want uh, people to have uh, protected communications online. We want to have a secret key that allows us to let ourselves into this. Why would you say we're, we're so caught up globally? And this is great for someone, you know, talking about Access Now that works with many different governments. Um, we're, we're arguing about legal changes, we're talking about reforms, we're talking about restructuring, we're talking about, oh, we just need to elect this party or this person instead of that person. But really the problems seem more fundamental when the rule of law is not delivering on its promises. Um, how do you see this dynamic? What, what should we do? Should we just be building up like the, the perfect sort of techno utopian privacy world where tools and science and math are guaranteeing our rights? Uh, will that never work? Uh, do we need people to be experts, you know, driving around and, you know, mapping out the access points around them and letting themselves in? Or is that, you know, as I would think, quite obviously a pipe dream? You can't expect people to do that. They don't have time to do that. How do you see this dynamic where the law is both 
the promise of a solution, but also uh, bait to defuse dissent because they pass laws, but then they don't honor them. Um, yeah, no, that's, uh, I mean, yeah, that's that's very difficult and that's that's where we are. But I, I, I wanna take us a bit, uh, you know, a, a bit back, you know, like 50, 60 years and 70 years of, you know, the, the African continent, we were all colonized and colonization was a law, was the rule of law for, uh, you know, people with lighter shade, um, you know, to have all the right in the world and for the rest of us not to have that, right? Um, so, the, you know, slavery used to be a law. <laughs> it was within the legal frameworks to be a slave uh, and to be owned by somebody. So for me, it's not, um, so that doesn't make me give up on the law, but the law needs to change. Um, the way that governments are understanding, you know, um, back end access to encryption is, is really ridiculous and it doesn't make any sense. It's not, it's in their benefit, it will benefit them, but it's not gonna benefit us. I can give you an example. I know many government officials in Ethiopia, in Kenya, and so many other countries that use Signal, <laughs> that use yeah. Signal for their corruption, that use Signal when they're stealing our money. No, it's, it's, that's the, and they know. Like I get so many notifications on my phone that the head of cybersecurity of a certain department is, is using Signal. Why are they using Signal? It's because they know it protects them against, you know, the public and, and the rule of law. So it's not, um, I, I think, you know, it's, it's not about, I, for me, it's not, it has never really been about, you know, what the government wants. I, I think it's about what the people want. And it's it's up to us, actually, you know, individuals like you and I and Rami and, and, and Alison and the rest of the people that are watching this to make, you know, encryption a priority for us. Who cares about what governments want? I think it's, you know, it's, it's the grassroots movements that make a difference at the end of the day. The reason why BLM has become so important today is because, you know, the people are out on the streets demanding. If you look at Belarus today, people have been protesting out on the streets every week since August 9th. If you look at, you know, Sudan, they've brought down a 30 year old dictatorship with, you know, a month, like a, a whole year of protests. So I think for me, it's about, you know, how do we organize around this issue and how do we make sure that these tools that we're using become the mainstream? How do we contextualize uh, you know, privacy? How do we contextualize encryption to the everyday individual? And and we can't call it encryption. We can't call it privacy because that's not what people understand. We have to meet people where they are. We're talking about digital hygiene, digital security. So how do we mainstream that? It's not about what governments want. If, if it was about what governments want, we would have all been, you know, um, slaves. We'd still have had colonization and Britain would have been the empire of the world. But no, that's like just because governments want something doesn't mean it happens. And we've, 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 we've organized against that. So I think, you know, we're at that stage now where we need to do this. It's not just governments actually. And I, I wanna push, push us a bit further to think about, you know, nonprofits as well. Look at what UNHCR, the United Nations Higher Commission for Refugees is doing. Look at what the World Food Program is doing. They're, for, they're forcing refugees to register, um, you know, their biometrics, um, you know, in order to access food, you have to give, uh, you know, you have to be biometric and you have to give your iris scan. That's the only way currently in Jordan, if you're a refugee, that you're able to access food. So it's not just about governments. It's not just about, you know, uh, these structures that we're talking about. It's also the misguided, you know, organizations that are also doing this. So it's, it's, it's up to us to push back. That's an incredibly powerful message. Um, and one I, I, I couldn't agree more with. The idea that, you know, um, government's going to reform itself which people you know always want they they go in and they vote and they go well this person said the right thing uh, and then as soon as the election's over they ignore politics for the next you know two four six years whatever happens to be in your jurisdiction they think everything will get better um but but power never admits anything um without a demand uh we have to force them to reform and exactly as you said it's important for us living in dark times, recognizing the threats uh, that we have around here. We have made so much progress. We have come so far. Uh, when you look at the dark swamp of history that we have crawled out of, uh, things were terrible. And as bad as things are today, they are getting better. But that improvement is not inevitable and it will not happen on its own. It is, you know, you watching, it is your generation, it is your actions that will determine what tomorrow looks like. If you don't fight for it, it does not exist, right? The only rights that you have are the ones that you defend. And as Barhan said, you know, regimes that lasted for decades, systems that were built over centuries can be undone in months if we work together. Um, with this, I, I'd like to go to, to final words um, for everybody. Um, Rami, when you look at uh, 
just context, how we're doing as a global society in, in terms of privacy, uh, in terms of the network, in terms of our rights, uh, how would you rate us? How are we doing? Um, are we getting better and where should we be going? Uh, what would you advise the audience? You know, what do we need and how can they help? Um, I think it's it, it's a bit challenging to summarize everything uh, in a few seconds, but I think on one hand, there are different perspectives. On one hand, globally speaking, we are doing better, for example, when it comes to mainstreaming, the concept of uh, privacy and encouraging more tool makers to uh, integrate encryption uh, and, and their systems or to ask Facebook to support uh, PGP or YubiKeys or, or things like that. But at the same time, uh, when you look into the European Union regulations around import and export of surveillance controls, it's, 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 it's very, it needs a lot of improvement and a lot of work and there is, and, and there's a huge gap enabling a lot of surveillance activities coming up from Europe to North Africa, for example. Uh, at some points, there could be some improvements. Uh, but I think when it comes to, community, to the community level and the solidarity level, uh, over the past six, seven years, the level of peer-to-peer of, of -peer sharing between the variety of community did help people to become more resilient to things, uh, but also to, to be able to, to spotify different problems that maybe usually in previous years weren't that obvious. Uh, I think it's, for me, it's important for people to have faith in open source technologies uh, and encryption. Uh, and as much as surveillance is a de facto situation, but believe me, there are different tools and ways to not just improve our use case, but to improve our behavior and to provide better internet and technology for our families and our loved ones. Thank you. Yeah, uh, this is really the, the the struggle particularly i think uh, of technologists around the world technologists as a class right as, as a working class um you can go you know you're, you you could be sitting at facebook right now you know you could be sitting in the the amazon data center uh and you can be doing good work right uh it can be a bad company it can still do good work um but you're being asked to make decisions every day about how you apply your skills and for whose benefit you truly work. Um, we all encounter forks in the road uh, where we can see, as Berhan mentioned in, in history, uh, the law says you can do this, says it's proper, says it's appropriate, but what is legal is not the same as what is moral. Uh, you could be contributing, uh, to free software projects. You could be contributing to a better direction for this company. You could be uh, revealing um, abuses in that company that the public is not aware of, but should be. Maybe you're not a technologist. There are other ways you can contribute. You can be out on the street. You can give. Maybe you don't have time to miss a day of work. You don't have that flexibility. Maybe you've got to take care of your family. Maybe you have other priorities. But if you can give, give to a project like the Tour Project or another force that's fighting for the good and the values that you believe in, uh, please do so. Uh, let me go to you, Allison, for the last word on this. Well, I think, you know, it's, I agree with my co-panelists that we've made enormous strides, but I also think that we're facing, you know, globally, the biggest problems that, uh, that we face as a society. I mean, I'm thinking about the way that power is consolidating around the world, um, particularly media power, big tech power. I mean, these are the biggest, most influential, influential geopolitical forces. Um, the way that police are militarizing around the world, the way that these forces work together, um, uh, support each other, or at least don't get in each other's way. Um, and the fact that climate collapse is already here for a, you know, a great deal of the world's population and is coming for a lot more of us. So I'm, I, I have, I don't feel super optimistic. Um, I do have, you know, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. I think that, you know, what Berhan said about, about our organizing, I think is really, really central. And that's the, that's the point that I want to leave with that facing 
all of these enormous problems and the level of, of power that is being consolidated and used against us, the people. And Ed, you mentioned the working class a few times, and I think that is really key. So what I want to say is, I know there's a lot of technology people who are watching this, a lot of people who work for companies like Amazon and Facebook, et cetera. I want to encourage those people to get organized. Um, there is an enormous labor movement that is happening in those places, um, from the white collar workers to all the way to people who are working in Amazon warehouses. And there's an enormous amount of, of intra solidarity, the recognition that these people are all members of the working class. And that kind of organization and that kind of fighting is one of the things that's gonna be able to give us a future. And so if that is you, um, please start organizing with your colleagues and maybe you should use Tor to do it so you can protect your privacy. <laughs> Great plug there at the end. Uh, Burhan, for the global perspective, uh, let, please just share with us uh, your last thoughts. Um, I, I would I would want to leave the, the audience with something that's quite concerning that's happening around the world. Um, you know, um, it's, I think for me, it's digital identity, uh, facial recognition, and particularly, you know, the push for cashless um, communities and societies. Um, and 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 you know, I'm not even going to get into you know the so many technological problems and you know things that you know the the problems that these 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 platforms cause. But the fact that they discriminate against majority of the people that look like me, the fact that you know um, they discriminate against people that are unable to access these um, you know these platforms is, is extremely concerning. And the fact that governments around the world, whether in Kenya, Ethiopia, you know uh, Niger, or um, or even you know, uh, UK or, or Belgium are forcing millions of their citizens to go, uh, you know, stand in a queue, provide their biometrics, and you know, um, and and base all of their identity, um, you know, to be pushed online is, is a is a major problem. We, you know, the data protection issues that we have faced, you know, the surveillance issues that we're facing, is going to be, uh, you know, in, in the next ten years, this is going to be a, a massive issue. The fact that you know refugees are being forced to provide their biometrics, the fact that refugees have to burn their fingerprints. So that they're not, you know, traced across the EU borders. The fact that refugees are dying in the Mediterranean is is insane, right? Like, so this is unacceptable. We are at the stage where, you know, the world is upside down, and we all seem to be just, you know, uh, not not worried about this. So this is a really concerning issue that we're seeing around the slide and see how people are discriminated, and you know how you know the surveillance structures are pushing this, the corporates are pushing this, the amount of you know digital identity, you know, corporate venture capitalists or what what we call the the vulture capitalists are you know are are circling every government from 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 India all the way to Ethiopia pushing them to get digital identity because it makes money for some individuals is insane, I think, and we should be fighting against that. Thanks. Thank you so much. This is a, uh, a point that I, I cannot help but underline. Um, when we talk about uh, biometric identity and the way we're being forced to enroll, uh, the way our devices are being used as proxies for biological identities, um, when you install an app, something like Instagram, anything that's asking for your phone permission uh, is not really uh, frequently these days asking to make calls. What it's doing is it's trying to get the identifiers on your phone, the hardware identifiers that it can then intersect with your username, with your face, with your uh, IP addresses, with your payment information with your email, all of these other things that they then share and cross-reference against other sources of data to create a perfect record of your private life uh, to the maximum extent that is possible for them. And I want you to think about whether this is a government program uh, or whether this is a corporate initiative, uh, where this kind of tracking and tracing of uh, human populations at scale will ultimately lead and understand that you're not going to see the costs of it today. You're not going to feel the consequences of it today, and neither will your community, because these are programs uh, the same way that government goes um, precedent shopping when it tries to outlaw something new, uh, when it tries to uh, gain a new government power, a new authority uh, to interfere or control our lives. Uh, they look for the most indefensible person or act or group that they can find, and they go after them. Set the precedent where it's easy, and then slowly, year after year, expand the circumstances, the exceptions in which that power, that system can be applied, can be used. And when we're talking about the Internet, when we're talking about surveillance, we are talking about power. 
They're not spying on our records. Uh, they're not monitoring your traffic because it's interesting to them. They're not doing this for fun. They're not interested in data for data's sake. You know, these are not academics. They're not performing a study. They're doing it because it provides them influence. It allows them to shape your behavior. It allows them to show you something that you wouldn't have otherwise seen that they think you will click on, which will nudge and uh, direct or misdirect your behavior, hopefully in the future. And it's not going to work every time. A thousand times it's not going to work, but on that thousand and first time, it will. And bit by bit, they begin to control the individual, and through the individual, they control the community, through the community, they uh, influence the society. And then we are captured. And when I say you will not feel the consequences today, you know, people go, I don't care, it doesn't matter, or, you know, I'm not looking at anything interesting. You are forgetting that when you say that, uh, you are making yourself vulnerable to a system that never forgets. Uh, you will be, you are effectively making a bet that if you don't matter today, if you don't have anything interesting to say today, if you don't have anything provocative or controversial to say, if you are not in the minority today, you never will be. But you don't know what tomorrow looks like. You don't know what you look like in tomorrow. You don't know what society looks like tomorrow. These systems, governmental and corporate, are trying to create uh, what they call frictionless systems. What they mean by that is they mean front-loading the joy right? Getting you the pictures you want, the connections that you want, those endorphin hits, uh, the dopamine that you want. And they are backloading the consequences. They're hiding it, they're concealing it, and you won't learn about it for five years, for 10 years, for, you know, 20 years. But then once you do learn about it, it's too late to unring that bell. It's too late to protect yourself. So protect yourself today by helping those who protect not just you, but those who are in the minority, who those who are vulnerable today, right now, and for fighting for their societies, for their freedom, for their lives and the future of uh, their countries all over the world. Please consider giving a gift to the Tor Project uh, on that basis. If it was convincing to you, if you enjoyed this conversation, if you see how these tools could be useful for you or simply you value those principles. This has been our third Priv Chat with the uh, Tor Project, uh, hopefully with many more to come. Uh, thank you so much for your time and your attention. Uh, and please feel free in the future to uh, send your ideas for timely uh, topics. Uh, you can hashtag this on whatever your uh, communication system of choice is uh, with Priv Chat with Tor or simply uh, reach out to anybody associated with the project. Thank you very much uh, and please stay free. Have a good night.